Welcome to the show, guys. Hi there, business owners, directors, and marketeers. In today's show, I'm meeting Rory Crawford. I'm Lucas, your host as always, and I want to tell you a little bit about Rory before we jumping into all the yeah, questions. So he's the co-founder and CEO of BevSpot. And prior to co-founding BevSpot, Rory spent four years in San Francisco doing um, technology, banking, and investing work at JP Morgan and General Atlantic. Um, and so he has been sort of around the block there quite a bit. So I'm very curious how that sort of led to, to BevSpot. Um, when he's not working on BevSpot, Rory spends his time playing uh, and spending time with his wife and his, his, very interesting actually, two identical twin daughters in his hometown in Wellesley. So, Rory, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me, Lucas. Great to be here. Very, very cool. So, tell us about BevSpot. What is it all about? Yeah, absolutely. You know, BevSpot, our mission is to uh, provide easy to use, simple software to the food and beverage industry to help rest restaurant operators run more efficient and profitable uh, businesses. Um, and that's really kind of our whole goal uh, is to deliver easy to use software to help them operate the way that we've seen it be done in a lot of other large industries. Yeah, makes total sense. Is there, what would be a typical user uh, be like? What type of maybe food and beverage business, uh, what type of uh, user, uh, user type, who usually uses the platform? Yeah, it's a great question. I think what's interesting about the food and beverage industry and just food and beverage in general is obviously it's one of the largest markets in the world. Everybody in the world needs to eat and drink every day. And actually where people are eating and drinking is a pretty varied, uh, you know, varied kind of mix. So we have clients ranging from airport lounges to hotels to country clubs to restaurants. But if I had to kind of explain one kind of very simple core customer, it'd be a restaurant. It'd be mm -hmm. an operator who owns a restaurant. Um, they're serving food and beverage to customers every single day, and they rely on that business uh, for their livelihood. Gotcha. And that's the restaurant manager, or who would be using the tool? Yeah, so it's kind of um, inside of a restaurant, you have a number of different people. So you obviously have an owner. Somebody owns the business. Uh, they may be hands-on. They may be hands-off. Uh, but they'll utilize our product. Uh, the, you, know, you have the owners. Uh, they'll utilize our product to access critical information about their profitability. Uh, to gain visibility into operations when they're not there. Then you'll have kind of the managers. So the people actually running the restaurant, the general manager, the beverage manager, the food manager, they'll use our product to actually uh, conduct inventory counts, to place orders, to price out recipes, to track profitability, to essentially run the actual operations uh, of that restaurant. And then the final lower level are the, um, you know, the lower level employees of the restaurant who may be responsible for prepping for a service who may be responsible for receiving deliveries in the morning. Uh, they'll use our product as well on their mobile devices to essentially uh, conduct tasks that are kind of relegated to them. So it's really a system to be used by every person within the, uh, the restaurant uh, in different ways, ultimately with the purpose of kind of enabling them all to operate more seamlessly and be more successful. Gotcha. And who would usually bring the tool into the restaurant, like in a way sort of that relates to how, what would be a typical user journey of somebody finding the product and starting it? And like maybe you could tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, it, it, and it's an interesting kind of question because at a high level, you have one of the largest industries in the world, also one of the most kind of antiquated industries in the world. It's wild, but, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the people we talk to on a daily basis are running their restaurant with a clipboard an Excel sheet and a yep. point of sale system. <laughs> so, you know, what you find is uh, a large portion of the market is still operating the way it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So what that means is actually the way we bring new customers to us is by advertising online and offering free so software tools to yep. people in the industry. And, and that may be an owner, it may be a manager. Um, and what they'll do is they'll find these free tools online uh, and they'll start actually using the software. So we have a very self-service, product-led kind of sales approach. So yep. we will actually drive people into our product. They'll create a free account. They'll start using the software. And then we reach out to say, you know, hey, Lucas, I saw you signed up. You know, what's your role over there? Oh, you're the manager trying to run the operations and struggling to do so on a clipboard. Or maybe you're the owner and you're a little worried about profitability as we get into the busy season. Ah, okay. Uh, and then we start to have that discussion about how we can potentially help you and your broader kind of organization. So it's 100% inbound led um, sales, but it could be the manager, it could be the owner, it could be a number of different personas within the organization, all of which are looking for a way to improve their performance uh, by utilizing software and tools that are out there. 
Very, very cool. I would have an interesting follow-up question on this. At least I'm very interested in it because uh, obviously restaurant managers and restaurant owners would probably, at least on first sight, not be the ones who would be checking out, you know, uh, let's say online blogs all the time to to improve their, their business. Like, how do you sort of spin that to, you know, win folks that would be working heavily offline to win them online? Yeah, it's very interesting, and, and I think it kind of goes to um, you know what you were talking about a little bit earlier. I mean, it, it can be difficult because if you're early in a market and there's uh, not a lot of um, recognized need for a solution, that means there's not a lot of kind of nascent search volumes. You know, there aren't a lot of people actually going on Google and searching for you know restaurant management software. <laughs> it is not a lot of traffic. It's not really a thing that's known. So what we've done is we've identified ways in which we can target people who have uh, something going in their mind about improving something. It may simply be to improve their, it may be to find a better inventory Excel sheet. It might be to find a faster way to place orders. Any one of these kind of point solutions that an individual may be struggling with, what you find is there's a lot more search traffic on those types of, uh, of terms. So what we do is we design our product to be built purposely to solve those individual problems within the context of a journey to expose that individual who may not have considered broader solutions to what we can do for them. So it's, it's, it's very interesting and, and it's really focusing on what is the problem that individual person may be kind of struggling with right now because at a high level, uh, restaurant owners and operators are struggling with many challenges. It's a very difficult business. So it's really about uh, identifying what those challenges are, uh, positioning our business as a potential solution to that small thing, and then that being the uh, the kind of launching point for a broader discussion about how we can help them. Very good. And then do, do those pointed solutions is what you mentioned earlier, right? For example, helping you with inventory management. Like, how should we imagine that uh, pointed solutions to be? Is that like a small tool? Is that a spreadsheet? Like, what is it usually that you would offer? Yeah, it's interesting. And it's been it's been a fun evolution for us. You know, it started out being, you know, every, you know, 80% of the industry uses Excel sheets. Okay. Now some Excel sheets are good. Some Excel sheets are not great. So we said, well, what if we just offered a really great Excel sheet online that you could download? And in order to download it, you had to submit a form, you know, kind of classic inbound lead model. Um, so, you know, we had some success with that because, again, there's a lot more search volume out there for that type of and even organic search. And we have some things we do there. Um, but then we said, well, you know what? The issue here is if they download a Google Doc or an Excel sheet, uh, they're never really getting exposed to software. Yep. So and really what we want to do is just get their wheels turning. So what we actually do is we convert we've converted all of those pointed solution experiences actually into in-app pointed yep. solution experiences. Yep. And what that does is, you know, the ability for an operator to on their mobile device while on a train or a bus to come into a tool, uh, experience what world-class ease of use web-based software can do for them uh, as they're potentially building out that sheet that they may want to take. Um, we've seen a lot more benefit to that. So now everything is really in app and every one of our kind of um, you know, free point solutions is actually just a broken off sub piece of the broader application, which enables us to kind of streamline the onboarding process while also educating that potential customer about, oh, wow, like I've, I've never done this before. I've never seen my products beautifully on a mobile device organized in a way that doesn't require a folder and paper. Uh, and, and that's really kind of the the, the core focus of our strategy is a lot of it is around that educational piece, but really getting their hands on software for the first time. I think I really like that. Really, really nice approach, really pointed solutions and then getting immediately help. Very, very cool. So my question would be then, what role does the website play in that overall sort of system? So you have the pointed solutions, people coming potentially also to the website at some point or the other. And so what, what role does the website play? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, at a high level, I think the website has to play a, a, a role of aggregating, um, you know, uh, visits uh, for people in this industry, you know, wherever they are in their buying journey, you know. So if they're simply out there trying to find good cocktails for the Christmas season, um, you know, we want to be there. We, we want to help them with that. And we want them to start to uh, experience our brand and our value. So we have a lot of, we've, we've invested a lot in content over time and it's not all specifically focused on our product or our solutions. It's much more focused on the industry as a whole. So we drive a lot of traffic, but then ultimately what we're really trying to do again is kind of educate people through our website. So help them start to think about their business potentially in a different way. You know, a restaurant isn't just, 
you know, making food and beverage uh, and then selling it to people. You know, although a lot of people start restaurants because they're passionate about cooking or, or, or making drinks, um, you know, there's a business side of it. And it's about uh, inventory efficiency. It's about profitability. It's about operational efficiency. Uh, so what we do is we have a lot of educational resources on our website that what we're really trying to do is help them start to think about their business um, in a different way, um, which may uh, bring to light questions about ways in which they could improve those metrics. And then that's really when the transition starts to happen with regards to, if you think about the world as a whole, there's been a big transition towards easy to use consumerized web-based software to help businesses. And that's where we like to say, you know, if, if you're starting to think about your, your restaurant, your passion as more of a business, and you're starting to think about some of the challenges you have, um, now maybe you should start to think about how some other industries have solved that challenge and then lead you to the consideration of, well, maybe there's software out there that can help me. Uh, that's really the big role of the website. And then the final piece is as you know, it pertains to um, topics you discussed earlier. It's just then how do we then collect information from that individual such that we can have a valuable conversation with them um, and really start to help them understand uh, all the elements of that kind of journey we, did, we just laid out. Really, really cool. And what would be the types of metrics that you wouldn't care about on the website? Because you can obviously look at a lot of different metrics, but what is key for you as a, as a leader there? Yeah, and it's, it's kind of... Uh, It's constant. It's kind of dynamic because it, it again. It's a very um, it's a very interesting industry. You know, these are people passionate about creating experiences for people. Um, they're not necessarily the most sophisticated business people. Um, so what you need to do is actually communicate to them metrics that matter and are easy to understand. So we really focus on a few key metrics. So the first key metric is you know what are your sales? You know what are your total revenues? But then the second metric, what are your profits? restaurant because they have such a complicated operating model where they're making so many different recipes and yep. each one of those recipes may have four or five different ingredients and the ingredients fluctuate in cost daily I actually understand how your profits are fluctuating daily it's almost real time like a marketplace so we try to really focus them on that metric do you know your profitability uh, if you don't is that an issue uh, if you do how are you thinking about improving it so you got sales and profitability Next, right? Because these are essentially supply chain businesses. They're buying things, they're putting them in other things, and they're selling them. So really, it's how efficient are you? If you are selling $1,000 of product every week, but you have $10,000 in inventory, you, and you're ordering new product every week, then there's a lot of efficiency improvements there. You could get down to two or $3,000 of inventory uh, to run the same business. And so we really focus on how much inventory do you have on hand relative to how much are you selling each week. And then we help them understand the delta between the two. And ultimately, that, that delta represents money that could be in the bank account and not in the storage room. Yep, uh, so it's really about the sales, profits, inventory, and, and, and efficiency. Very, very good. And for your own, yeah, you as a business leader uh, for BevSpot, like what types of metrics do you care on your website? What, what would be key there? Yeah, absolutely. I think we, we, we care, you know, if we start at kind of the bottom and then work our way up to the top, ultimately we care about the number of qualified leads entering, uh, and we define qualified leads as product qualified leads. So people who are actually landing in our product, how many of those are we generating uh, any given day, week, or month? Mm -hmm. um, and then of those leads, uh, we then track how are they getting through the sales cycle. So how are they converting into conversations for the sales reps uh, and ultimately you know, conversions from free to paying customers? And then as we start to move above um, the conversion funnel, we start to think of, okay, well, if we're getting this many you know, product qualified leads, um, where are they coming from? Uh, what is the cost per conversion, cost per lead? What is the cost per impression, cost per click? Um, and then kind of what's the efficiency overall of that uh, acquisition funnel? Yep. Um, and then on the kind of more website, kind of broader approach, it's more generic traffic impressions. You know, how many people are we influencing uh, organically and, and kind of what is that scale and reach of our website? Makes, makes total sense. I would have one follow-up question on there because I had that conversation with a lot of founders on the show um, and there has been very different uh, schools of thought on that. You have the, the schedule a chat or schedule a demo type of button and then you have the starting the free trial, so which is two different routes. Like, What do you focus on? How do you sort of relate them each other? What are the different metrics you care on for each of the, the both sort of paths? 
Yeah, it's, it's really it's really a great question, and it's one we've you know experimented with a lot over the years because you know in the in reality anybody that schedules a chat to speak with us about our product um, they convert at extremely high rates. They're very valuable. If you think about where they are in their buying journey, you know they're proactively scheduling time on their calendar with a salesperson <laughs> to discuss a solution. Um, it, that is a, an incredibly high quality lead. Uh, now, the issue is if you go back to the um, original topic of uh, uh, search volumes, awareness, uh, all of that stuff, what we find is there, those are very expensive leads to generate for us. Um, so we've experimented with ways to generate more demos, but we find that that commitment of scheduling time with a sales rep is actually a pretty large hurdle. It drives cost per conversion up pretty significantly. We love those and we generate a lot of those organically, but we've actually gone to a place where we won't pay for them and we really won't optimize for them. Mm -hmm. What we're now optimizing for are those pointed solutions mm -hmm. that are much more immediately valuable to the user mm -hmm. and that are oriented around um, a free trial, which to us enables them to A, access the solution to their immediate need uh, for free, but B, expose themselves to software, and then C, um, you know, enter into our sales funnel. And then it's kind of the combination of um, a much more consultative sales approach with leads who have now been in the product to some extent, um, who are earlier on in their buyer's journey. So it is an interesting dynamic, but we, we really love the, the free trial approach, the free software approach, because we've found it to be a much more scalable and cost-effective way to generate conversations. And we believe in it over time. And, and it also selfishly, our vision is to be a, you know, a, a truly self-service software product. Yeah, makes, makes we sort of thing. 100% focus on, yeah. It, so it, it plays nicely into that strategy as well. Very cool. Yeah, I was very curious to ask that because I think, you know, behind these two buttons can be such a big story internally. So I was so curious to, to how you guys are thinking about it. Very, Absolutely. very... Very cool. Yeah, so uh, I would be maybe like to switch gears a little bit and learn a little bit about you as a business as owner and founder who's been building up the company. Maybe you can share the story of how you got to the first 10 customers when you were building out the solution. You know, it's always hard to get it off the ground. It's always difficult, you, especially in, a, in an industry which is not maybe known for, you know, jumping on software right away. So how, how was that? What was that like? And how did you get the first 10? Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, even even just getting to a point where I could sign up customers was a whole, you know, journey. Um, but but I think, you know, early on, we, you know, I, I, I really viewed it as an opportunity. You, you touched on it at the beginning. My background was in, you know, technology and technology investing in amazing mobile software companies early on in that life cycle of the of that kind of shift to mobile software. If you think the timeline was kind of 2009 to 2013. So iPhone came out in 2007. So this was really the first wave of like, you know, mobile first software companies. And I saw the impact it could have on large industries like transportation and lodging with Airbnb and Uber and Facebook with social media. So I, I just thought it made so much sense. So the food and beverage industry needs great mobile software that can be accessed on the device in their pocket. So, okay, great idea. So then I had to like figure out how to communicate that, uh, how to hack together a prototype that I could actually show people uh, and then how to actually get people to use it. And getting the first handful of customers, I mean, it was really just going door to door and and door to door trying to first find people who would let us essentially waste their time uh, by telling us what they needed us to build and then us building it in real time next to them and then being able to have them use it and, 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 and kind of uh, give us feedback very quickly. Once we had a few of those beta users or almost like alpha users, um, then we were able to build a little bit of a product. So then I went to the, you know, said, okay, well now I got to get some people to pay us. So I said, all right, we're ready. We've got 30 free users. Time to get our first paying user. And I was actually telling the team this the other day. So I go out, I'm like, we're going to charge $100 a month for our product. And I'm like, yeah, great. So then I'm marching door to door all over Boston trying to convince somebody to pay us $100. And I'm really literally walking, literally walking in, knocking doors. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, walking and knocking doors. So, by the way, it was one of the worst winners of all time here in Boston. So, I'm like tramping through the snow and, like, you know, I'm like, hey, like, you know, we got this great product that's going to help you. And nobody would buy it. You know, nobody would buy it. And, and I remember feeling like, oh my goodness, you know, this is over. We're never going to get a customer. Like, and I just remember, like, what can I do? So, I said, well, if I can't get anybody to pay me 100, can I get somebody to pay me 50? So, I started, I went back out, went door to door, and I said, hey, like, Price is cut in half, $50. And what happened was I got a couple people to pay pay me $100. And, I, and that was kind of like 
the first time it kind of clicked that, you know, hey, there could be real value here. These people will pay for the product, even though it was very, very early and raw. Um, and those, you know, first $50 customers helped me go door to door to find the next $100 customers. And it just kind of started from there. But I think it was a very interesting example of, um, you know, thinking creatively and saying, if I can't accomplish one thing, let's reduce the goal and then get that accomplished to move on to the next goal. Uh, you know, and now we've got thousands of customers all over the world. And it's, uh, it's funny to look back on those, um, on those first customers. Very, very cool. Could you give me an idea of time of like, what are we talking about a couple of weeks, a couple of months, a year, two years, you're going through that process? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I kind of started the company when I was at, at school, uh, at Harvard Business School. It was kind of nights and weekends project, teaching myself how to code, hacking a prototype, recruiting some co-founders, doing all this stuff. Then really entering into 2015, we dropped out of school and started pursuing it full time. Um, so kind of early 2015, say like the first 2015 was going door to door trying to sign up free free users, then $50 users, then $100 users. And I think it took us, you know, probably four or five months to sign up like 50 people. Um, and, and then it was kind of like a little bit of a hockey shape. So once we kind of got that going, you know, we really started to feel like, hey, I, I think we could have a real business here. I, I think there could be product market fit if we are able to actually execute on the product vision. Yep, very, very cool. As we're slowly coming to an end of the interview, I would like to ask you uh, one and a half, <laughs> two last questions. So um, basically, uh, one thing I would like to know is you as a founder, uh, how do you educate yourself? What is things or places where you check that you're sort of, you know, a better founder today than you were yesterday? Is there certain blocks that you could shout out or any books that you can, can recommend? What is it that you would do? Yeah, great, great question. And that's been, you know, an education. When I started, I had no idea what I was doing. I still don't have any idea what I'm doing. Uh, but I, I think I've developed a better process for learning. Um, and I think that's critical. So I think it's a, it's, it's a kind of a multifaceted approach. I think, you know, one approach is mentorship, you know, finding people who have been through it before, um, you know, advisors, investors, mentors, uh, other founders going through the same thing as you. Uh, you've got to have a, a large network and you have to be proactive, which is hard to do sometimes when you're very busy, proactive about spending time with them. Every single conversation, I find I walk away with another nugget and another piece of information. And that just kind of builds my, my knowledge base. The second piece I've gotten into you know, very heavily recently is, um, is reading. And, I, and listening to audiobooks, I, um, I, I get made fun of around here. I listen to audiobooks. I love audiobooks because I can listen on accelerated speed. So I'll listen to books at two, two and a half speed. And what that does is it just enables me to like, download a lot of information. And I like books about all kinds of things. I, I, I'm a big uh, believer that like a, a varying range of knowledge can be very powerful. So if you know, you know things about maybe biology, and you know things about software and machine learning and different concepts, uh, a lot of times those there are core principles that can be applied to your business. So I love reading like just very varied, um, you, know, you know, knowledge and like learning varied things that I can then apply to the business. And then the final piece is, you know, reading point uh, books or resources on pointed solutions. So things that I'm struggling with, like scaling a business or selling, consultative selling. I'll go out and find books that I can read on that. I don't do a lot of um, blog listening, I, 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 although I do occasionally. I think it can be valuable. But I try to really fill those discussions through in-persons with people who uh, you know, would t traditionally kind of contribute to those types of blogs. So it's much more kind of holistic reading, uh, mentorship, and, and, and kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, lessons and learnings. Um, and then picking out pointed solutions or people I can, I can follow or read that I think are very valuable. Very, very cool. Thanks a lot for giving that framework. I think that's probably even much more important than giving a specific resource, that framework on how you're educating yourself. Very, very cool. Last question to wrap it up. Um, if you would put yourself back into the situation where you were marching through the snow in Boston trying to get that restaurant, what would be one piece of advice that you would give yourself knowing what you know today? Uh, I would, I would just, I would tell myself to, uh, you know, uh, get ready for a long haul. I think, you know, I, I think the, the journey, um, teaches you a lot about the, um, you know, the, the length of the journey, right. You, you know, you start a race, not knowing how long the race is. And I think it's easy for founders sometimes to start a company and to think it's a, you know, It's a, it's, a, it's a relatively short race. And it's not. Um, you know, it is a very long, long kind of marathon. It's a long race. And I, I think if I could go back, I would have, I would have you know, advised myself to 
uh, understand that, to incorporate that into the way I set expectations for myself, for my family, for investors, um, for everybody. Because I think too often, I know I fell into this trap, um, you know, when you're very early and you've got some good, exciting things going on and it's your first time, uh, you may not fully appreciate the amount of um, effort and time it takes to truly build a great company. And if you don't appreciate that, then you can set artificial expectations. And then if those artificial expectations are um, not in line with reality as time progresses, it puts a lot of, uh, I think, emotional, psychological, and even just logistical stress on you and the business. So if I could go back, I would have kind of been much more thoughtful to advise myself about, hey, this is how this journey likely looks, uh, as people will tell you. So make sure you're planning accordingly. Very, very cool. Really, really cool. Thanks a lot for sharing that insight, sharing a lot about the journey that you went through in building up the company, the story of how you got the first couple of customers to where you're at today. So um, I really, really appreciate you being part of the show today and showing us a bit of insight. Thanks a lot, Rory. Thanks, Lucas. Appreciate it. Have a good one.